I'm a 31 year old female, and I've had a long history with drugs. I started using heavy hard drugs when I was 21. Now I'm five foot and 135 pounds. I've always been on the smaller side, not the type you'd look at or even imagine I touched a joint in my life. I have a baby face. And most people guess I'm 25 years old. When I was 21, I looked like a preteen. A good example of this was when I was 18, my boyfriend and I went to Cincinnati Reds opening game, and the first 100 kids under 14 got a free bobblehead. Well, I received a free bobblehead. My poor boyfriend felt very awkward to say the least, but this is getting off topic. Just basically, I want to point out how I look young for my age. This event happened when I was 23. So I looked like I was 16. I was sitting alone on a notorious drug street in a very bad area of Cincinnati. This was incredibly stupid of me. But at the time I had this mentality that I run the streets. I have these hitters that got my back. So no one would ever dare miss with me. Obviously, this was a very stupid mentality to have, which was tested and changed my mentality forever, and made me far more street smart and cautious. In fact, I'm very lucky to have made it away from that situation completely unharmed. It definitely messed me up for quite a while, and made me much more aware of my surroundings, and who I deal with and who I trust. I was sitting on a street waiting for my lottery guy to pull up to give me my lottery tickets and be on my way so that I can play the lottery. I'm sitting there in my vehicle, minding my own business, jamming out and not paying any attention to anything going on around me. Because I had this stupid mentality that I was untouchable. This guy comes and taps my driver's side window. Bear in mind, I've never seen this guy before. But anyone who knows anything about playing the lottery on the streets knows that sometimes there are others who come and bring your deliveries. It's not always your same guy. But generally, they will let you know if someone is taking their place. So I crack down my window. And they go, Hey, you looking for some tickets? Nah, but if you want to throw me a ticket with your number on it, I'll keep you in mind because I do play a lot of games. It's always good to have more than two guys. Ah, oh, cool, cool. I live right there. I'll go grab you some tickets and be right back. No red flags going off just yet. Because bear in mind, a lot of lottery dealers get new customers in this way. Then I see him coming back with another dude. My car was this little Honda Civic with manual locks, and I did not lock my doors. That's when this guy immediately opens the driver's side door and puts a weapon against my head. Are you pregnant? He asks. And this catches me completely off guard. It was winter and cold. But me being female, I'm like, No, I'm not pregnant. Do I look pregnant to you? Give me your money, he says. Now never before or since have I been in a situation like this. And honestly, I feel very blessed by this. He keeps telling me that I need to give him my money or that he'll pull the trigger. I have horrible anxiety. And honestly, I couldn't think of what to say and just said, Give me a minute, I just need a minute to think. He actually stops and goes, Okay, the horn on my car didn't work, or I'd have been blowing it like crazy. Now me being a big lottery player, and only having enough money on me for two tickets, I couldn't give this dude my money, I'd be sick. And I had work and stuff to do. So I call his bluff. I don't have any money. My lottery dude fronts me my tickets, I say. I watch him as he moves the weapon around to whip me, which he wasn't even doing correctly. At that moment, I knew this guy didn't have it in him and had no idea what he was doing. Fortunately for me. So I lean my face into the passenger seat. And proceed to bicycle kick him in his nuts. I had Timberland boots on, unfortunately for him. Then I start screaming, 
saying that I'm being robbed and that his fingerprints are all over my car door and handle. This has the desired effect. Him and his friend start running away. And as you can imagine, I did not go back to that area to purchase my lottery tickets anymore. Thankfully, I no longer buy lottery tickets. But if you do buy off the street, please be safe out there. And always lock your doors. I just want to say something. If you are someone who buys lottery tickets off the street and don't want to be, I do want to say there is hope for you. I was told by my counselor at rehab that there was no hope for me, and they were wrong. There was hope, and I'm doing great things now. I may have lost everyone and everything, but I also began to gain that back after I lost my way. But I'm back. I'm fortunate enough to have a great mum and family who are always there for me. Please, don't think it's too late like I did. We all have someone who loves us and needs us, regardless of what you do or have done. You're special and amazing. And I just think that there are some of you out there who may need to hear it, but you're worth it and special. You can find yourself again, and there is hope for you. I was and still am living in Kelowna, British Columbia. At the time I was 17 and living with my mum but working full time. I normally left the house about 4am to walk into work for 4.30. I started my walk like I did every other morning, got myself bundled up, it was during the winter, put my headphones in and started to make my way to work. I get a few houses down from my mum's place and a guy steps out onto the sidewalk. He shouts something out at me that I don't quite understand because I had my music in my ears. So I pulled out an earbud and asked him to repeat himself. He looked at me with this wide eyed look, and I immediately regretted asking him to repeat what he said. Jesus loves you, he says in this creepy sing song voice. Ah. Uh, Thanks, I guess. And Jesus wants me to take your life. At this point, my blood ran cold. The street was empty beside us. I was training in martial arts at the time, so I kind of shifted my stance knowing full well I could get my ass kicked, but I still didn't want to show fear. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the pepper spray my mum handed me earlier for when I walked around at such an early hour. I showed it to him and screamed with all that I could to leave me alone. Leave me alone right now, I'm gonna call the cops. Jesus loves you. He said that, half sung, half in a mocking tone, and skipped like an excited child away from me. I walked down the road a bit further and called my parents on the house phone from my cell so that the ring would wake someone up. And when my dad answered, I practically shouted at him to meet me outside with my mum and bring the phone out in case he decided to follow me home. Upon getting there, I called the cops and they told me something similar had happened to a girl my age and she kept walking. But when she turned the corner, three other guys attacked her and nearly ended her life. Because it was so dark, I couldn't really make out the details about this guy or that I could tell is that he was high or something. I stayed home for three days and refused to leave my house because it happened not more than three houses down from where I lived. The police couldn't really do anything as I didn't have a description and they weren't sure if the attackers and taunting Jesus loves you guy were working together or if it was just unlucky for the previous girl. This happened a long time ago. Before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mum in my early 30s, who had just driven our kids to the paediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office, was an hour away from our home, and I was taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day. 
and we were grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off a fresh spur of the highway. So the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot. And my car, a black Jeep we had owned for two years was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats. And for the next hour or so we waited, then saw the doctor paid and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot as I loaded the children in their car seats for our trip home. But as the receptionist locked the front glass doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in and asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book and the man said that he would come but that it might take a little bit. So I told him my location. I left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. As soon as we watched all the lights were turned out in the building. And again, everyone left. Their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to take quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot and a man got out of his pickup, smiled, nodded at me, and said that he was going to raise the hood. He was middle aged and a bit scruffy. But quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes looked that way, especially at the end of the day. And I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open waiting for him to tell me to try the engine. But he seemed to be taking a long time checking the connections and I longed for him to just grab the jump starter cables, yet he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong. And he said, Oh, it's just a loose wire, not the battery, and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting. But his hands were slightly visible through the long horizontal slits between the windshield and the raised hood. More than once, he said it was merely a loose wire. And if I would just come up here real quick, he could show me which one it was. So it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly, there was no reason to show me anything as I didn't know anything about cars, and just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat. Again, just waiting for the inevitable signal to try to start the ignition that was most surely going to come at any moment. At one point, I remember thinking that he was definitely flirting as he spoke. But I was trying above all else to be polite and kind, as he was indeed helping us. We were hot, tired and miserable. And truthfully, I was distracted with the two young kids. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little more frustrated with me. Because I wouldn't come up to look at the engine. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad when he left us there all alone with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled into that desolate parking lot. And as it did, the nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it and drove away very quickly without even saying goodbye. I was both confused and a little anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little frightened that he had suddenly left me alone with two little ones defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed 
the sullen gentlemanly thing to do. I looked around and was very aware once again there were no visible cars on the road, nor homes or businesses nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new unmarked pickup pulled up next to me, I got out of the car once again, this time more apprehensive. Upon exiting though, he immediately introduced himself and his name and voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I smiled back in surprise and told him, well, I don't know. I thought all this time he was you. And we both laughed slightly. And then he grabbed the jumper cables, walked in front of my car, raised the hood and started to work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that with luck, the air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly. And once again, checking the children. While listening for the familiar words, try it. I had my back completely turned towards the children when he surprised me by suddenly coming to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice, he said, uh, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hand, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-like looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish dust. Yet, on one end, it had tiny circular small finger holes. It was as if it was a mix of a long thing sword and scissors oddly combined. I remember being amazed, but not frightened. And I asked where he had found them. Under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter of factly, that I'd never seen them before. But how weird it was that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years and shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them, unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale too. Like he couldn't find the right words to speak for a bit and just continued to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care about it one bit. All I could think about was getting the car going, letting me pay him the cost and leaving. He didn't say anything else, just quickly set them up on the curb, started his truck and then signaled me to start the Jeep. And when it immediately caught my three year old cheered. Gratefully, I turned on the air conditioning in full blast, rolled up the windows, armed the air vents back towards the back seat and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so that I could hear the amount I owed. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side, but instead of handing me the bill, irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up the weird object once more. Ma'am, he said slowly, I want you to look at these one more time and held them out for closer inspection. This time I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item still appeared to be incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet looking quality, except for the strangely small two loops on the end. I'd never seen anything like it. And I told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. These weren't hidden somewhere in the engine, ma'am. They hadn't been there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there. I shook my head and said no, and half smiled as I said, but they're obviously very old and rusty. To which he pointed more closely and replied, yeah, but see how sharp they are. These look like they've just been sharpened. And when I looked down, he was right. The long skinny dagger like shape was unusual. But by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. 
The edges at the tip were where the rust had been removed and were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm really glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I probably needed to call the police when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted them. I didn't want to touch it, didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so he could place it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way and me turning the other, towards the small winding highway that would lead me home still an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment that we arrived home and I got the children safely inside. But although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like things to them later. The officer I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialised surgical shears from my description and measurements over the phone, which I found quite disturbing as you can imagine. I remember wondering how he could even know that, why he would even say that. I had tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping they may be able to lift prints or test for blood if they wanted, but the story seemed to bore him a bit, and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the very end of the call, as if to wind things up, he did say it sounded as if I was very lucky, and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper, placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, and they remained there for several more years untouched, until we moved away, and I finally, not wanting to bring them across several states, reluctantly threw them in the trash. Around that time though, if you look through old news reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I have often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did, if my children would still have a mother, if I still would have had my son and daughter, if I would have missed all these years with them. I guess I'll never know. But I learned something very important about myself that day. I've always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading people, and staying safe. But because I was exhausted, and tired, and hot, and stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit, and wasn't working at that time. And many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day, and my lack of awareness, could have easily cost us our lives. I grew up for the most part in an Australian city, but lived with my grandmother in a small country town in rural Australia for a while. This town was about a 25 minute drive away from a larger country town that we did all our major shopping in once a week or so. We go into this town to do some clothes shopping and pull up into the shopping center car park, which directly connected to the entrance of the center with the closest car park only a few meters away from the entryway. 10 meters from that entrance, there was another entryway to a standalone store. The store was quite large with many aisles, and the cash registers right near the entrance on the left side of the door. We'd finished our shopping in the main center and had gone into the other store to do some shopping, and my grandmother noticed a man who would come in not long after us and was floating around the entrance, looking in very suspiciously. We were in an aisle about 10 meters from where he was, and me being the young, oblivious kid I was, didn't notice him, and just continued to look at different shirts for sale. I moved further up the aisle, and every step 
that I took closer to the end, he inched a little closer towards us. I didn't notice this, but I remember my grandmother walking up to me and putting her arm around my shoulder and telling me to stay right next to her. I remember looking at an item and asking my grandmother how much it was as I couldn't see a price tag. So I asked if I could go ask the cashier. She reluctantly agreed, but told me to walk straight to the counter and back. As I walked to the counter, he moved even closer to me. It was just left of the door, perhaps five meters from the guy. And I'm guessing he thought I was walking towards the exit. As I only changed my direction right as I got to the counter, all of a sudden, he grabbed me by my left arm and tried to pull me towards him. But as I just changed direction towards the counter, he wasn't able to get a good enough grip of me, and I pulled away quickly. He looked so startled and shocked that he just ran straight out the door and into a car just outside and pulled away. That was it. No number plate, no police, no nothing. My grandma grabbed me, and we left. I can't help but think, what if this wasn't his first time? What if he succeeded after me? Or if I'd heard stories of children going missing before and after that, that he was responsible for? Did he spot me while we were shopping earlier and wait for the best opportunity to try it? I hate to think what could have happened and what may have happened after that day. But creepy guy, I now have a baseball bat and I hope to not meet you again. I'm a 22 year old guy from South Africa. And this incident happened about two years ago. You must understand that South Africa has been notorious for having a high crime rate, especially at night. I'm a six foot tall guy, relatively big, and I'm a complete introvert. I was never a big fan of going to clubs and parties. My friends always knocked me for being so antisocial and for being such an introvert. So this one time I decided to tag along with them. When we got to the club, it was better than I expected it to be. The vibe and music was amazing, but I never danced or socialized with anyone. My friends went off to socialize and chat up people being the social butterflies they were. As for me, I just stood there awkwardly and alone until this one girl came up to me. She was petite, attractive, and hit me up with a Hey, I'm Chelsea. In my head, I was filled with confusion. I mean, it's not like I was the most attractive bloke. I went with the flow and introduced myself nonetheless. We were then sat at the counter over a few drinks. We had an awesome conversation going. And after a few drinks, I noticed the conversation started to feel a bit awkward. She kept on glancing a few times at something or someone behind me and started to speak less and seemed less interested in what I was saying now. With me being in such a tipsy state, I didn't even bother to turn around and to see who it was she was looking at. And after a few more drinks, I had an incredible buzz going for me, and then decided to go out for a cigarette and excused myself from the girl I was chatting to. As I was outside, I could feel my legs being hard to move. My head became heavy and I became lightheaded and dizzy. I thought it was just the alcohol. I brushed the uneasy feeling off and went outside, lit my cigarette and started to browse through my phone. Then I could hear footsteps approaching me. Another guy was coming towards me. He introduced himself as Craig and tried to bum me a cigarette. Reluctantly, I reached for my pocket and gave him one. My vision then started to get really blurry. I was losing my balance and couldn't stand straight. Then I saw two more silhouettes walking towards me and felt a blow to the back of my head. I woke up to the faces of my friends a few hours later, only to realize I was in a hospital bed. And according to them, one of them had seen me going outside when I went for a smoke. They proceeded to go out and join me. When they eventually got there, 
they saw three men holding me as if I were passed out drunk and walking to a nearby truck in the parking lot. My friend then called out the guys. They turned around, dropped me and fled in their truck. According to the medical, I had some drug substance in my body and was in shock. Then it hit me. That girl, Chelsea, she kept on dropping a few of her belongings towards my side of the chair. Me being in a buzzed and happy state, I was happy to pick them up thinking it was gentleman's etiquette. I was really oblivious to the fact that she was purposefully doing that to distract me. She then probably threw something in my drink and then began to signal the guys behind me that her objective had been completed. From what I've heard, there were incidences where an attractive girl is used to lure lonely and vulnerable looking guys into a trap. So the guys can take them somewhere to do who knows what. Their intentions weren't to rob me because they never took any of my belongings. They clearly had something much more sinister planned. I'm glad my friends saw me leaving at the time. And it scares me to know what could have happened if they didn't. Stay safe people and be very careful at clubs and parties. Don't lose sight of your drink. And be cautious of strangers who come across as too friendly. You never know what their real intentions might be. I had recently gotten a job and had more money than I was used to having. So of course, being the fiscally irresponsible 18 year old I was, I was constantly online looking at Amazon and Groupons and just anything to spend my money on. I found a Groupon for a local pizza slash game place just outside of the county of OKC, kind of like a Dave and Buster's, but with a pizza and dessert buffet, among other party place food items. The food was right past the hostess counter on the left, and to the right was a room with chairs and booths and anything to eat at. Typical arcade eatery things. Walking past the food and dining area was the huge back area with the games and a small roller coaster. I went with my older sister, who didn't seem incredibly into the place, but was content to hang out with me and just spend time together. Looking back, if I had a license, I may not have gone with her, and I shudder to think what would have happened. After playing the games, we could and found interesting. She wanted to sit down and eat. We had gone on this simulated roller coaster ride with the double plastic seats and a screen in front of them, the kind that shakes and tilts and gives kids a good time without giving their parents a heart attack on a real roller coaster. She joined me for one of the simulated experiences and said that she felt sick from it. It's understandable since it's very jerky and our mum has vertigo, most likely passing it down to us. But I wanted to do the rest because it was the most fun we had since we went in. She said I could by myself, but she was going to grab a plate and wait for me. I don't know what made me get back up, but as soon as she left, I really didn't want to be alone. I'd gotten lost before as a young child in a similar place, so I figured I was just being socially anxious and paranoid as normal. Even though nothing was wrong, I still didn't like being alone in public because I'm just over five feet, barely over 100 pounds, and look much, much younger. I got up, found her at the buffet, about to sit down, and hurried to grab a plate and a slice of pizza and a few sweet things. Shortly after we sit down and start eating, a young woman sits next to me. And luckily for her, I'm on the passive end. And while I'm incredibly uncomfortable, I shift over to give her room, mostly just to distance myself from her, because I always tried to keep my boundaries and don't like people touching me. If she had tried that stuff on my sister, she would have not budged an inch and probably even bumped her off. If it wasn't weird enough, that this weird lady sat down next to me, she started acting like she knew us, saying stuff like, I can't believe you guys left me back there. I was calling you. Wow, Aaron, why are you ditching us? All the while laughing like we tried to pull a joke on her and she saw through it. My sister looks at me. Do you know her? 
even though she's 100% sure that I don't, she just wants to establish we aren't friends and maybe she mistook us for them in some way. I shake my head. Okay, who the hell are you, woman? I'm sorry, but we don't know you. Please sit elsewhere, my sister said. Her words polite, but in a matter of fact tone. I should also mention, my sister practically raised me because we had a single mum, who, if she wasn't working to support us, was going out on dates to try and find Mr. Wright. So my sister is amazingly protective of me and an absolute rock star when it comes to weirdos trying to make me feel uncomfortable. And she knows of my social anxiety and boundary issues. So this whole situation is not okay. Don't be silly, we went to high school together, this woman says. Still trying to insist, we simply forgot her. This raises huge red flags for my sister, because we moved around a lot from a young age and almost never stayed in the same place for over a year. Not to mention my sister attended high school in Hawaii, Oklahoma and Louisiana, and I attended the same school in Hawaii and a school in Missouri and two others in Oklahoma. We both attended the same high school a few years apart in a very small town, so small that even people in neighboring areas hadn't heard of it. The school that I uniquely went to was in a smallish town and I dropped out when I was 18 because they were racist and sexist amongst other things. I stay quiet, my sister getting annoyed. What was the name of the school? My sister asks, knowing she'll never say the name of the school we attended Oh, you know, we went together. We even had a few classes. Don't you remember me? She said her name was Bunny, and neither of us knew anyone personally with that name. No, I don't remember you. Which school was it so I can try and remember? My sister pressed, and the woman kept saying that we should remember her, and tried to avoid the question. My sister then got fed up. You need to leave. We don't know you. You're making us uncomfortable. And after a bit more of trying to convince us we were wrong, she got up, huffed off through the door that looked to be employees only. And I didn't get close enough to see if it was the case, but the bathrooms were on the other side and no one went near that door, save a few staff. It was a strange occurrence. We finished eating and considered telling the security guards, but since she was already gone and nothing actually happened, we shrugged it off and went home not feeling like sticking around in case she was lingering. Writing this gave me horrible feelings looking back. If I'd been more independent and got my license and went alone, or if I'd have stayed at that ride and she pushed herself next to me and tries to force conversation, I would have been too awkward to say anything and might have let her go too far. What could her intentions have been? My sister feared she might be a scout for traffickers or something because she kept repeating the same lines and looking around. Perhaps she genuinely thought that we had gone to school together, but in that case, why could she not say the name? I think it's just too odd of a situation to completely discount the fact that it could have had a very nefarious intention behind it. Back in 2007, I found myself working as a bartender at a now closed pub in my hometown. Not a job I particularly liked, but it paid the bills. At this time, they had hired a new kitchen manager that we all simply knew as Kearney. Kearney was a pleasant enough guy, mostly keeping to himself, but always stayed late to help the barman do our closing duties. So we all liked him for that. New in town, Kearney had yet to find a place of permanent residence, and I had recently lost my tenants, so someone suggested he asked me. He was considerably older than the tenants I usually took in, but having a streak of bad luck with tenants my own age, I thought an older man with a nice steady job may be a shift in the right direction. So I agreed. Kearney wasted no time and followed me home that very same night. Only he wasn't alone. Enter Lawrence, the boyfriend of Kearney. Honestly, I hadn't even recognized he was gay up to that point, but was water off my back regardless. 
Looking back now, what really should have bothered me though, was Lawrence's appearance. He looked like he had been sleeping on the streets, rather appropriately as I would find out later. Kearney moved in. Lawrence was there a lot too. And it was easy to know when due to his mobile ringtone sounding like the quacking of a duck. Kearney had some habits that were rather noteworthy to this story. In particular, he basically never closed his bedroom door no matter what he was doing in there. It was always open. And although he was a heavy smoker, he never once smoked inside the house. After Kearney had been living there for about two weeks, I had come down with an awful case of pink eye. This being highly contagious, I was given leave of absence from my bartending job and therefore decided to go wait it out at my sister's for a few days. Apparently I didn't mind giving it to her. The day my sister was scheduled to come pick me up, I took a casual stroll into the bar that myself and Ben, a good friend from high school, at the time, co-worker, had been building in my house. And something caught my eye. All our liquor bottles were completely empty. Now, those who had been frequenting my house at the time would know that we weren't just talking about one or two bottles of brandy here, but bottles of whiskey, gin, vodka, snaps, liqueurs. Basically, it was a fully stocked bar that could host pretty big parties without requiring much in the way of additions. So I called Kearney in, asking him what he knew about this, receiving feedback that Lawrence and he had been on a slight drinking binge. Those were the actual words he used, and had left me both furious about the thousands worth of stock they had drunk out, but also slightly impressed that he was actually still alive. Regardless, I said that I would be dealing with this upon my return. So I'm with my sister for a few days, and on Friday I get a call from my local police department, asking me if I know Conrad Schultz. Ironically, even though I didn't, they finally add that I will probably know him as Kearney, and that I should probably come down to the station, as they had just arrested his boyfriend, trying to sell my camera equipment. So my sister rushes me back home where all my camera equipment was on display at the police station. It's on this visit that I'm informed that Lawrence was actually a Navy SEAL, who got dishonorably discharged before turning to a life of crime, and now had a rap sheet the length of the Bible. The kicker was that both he and Kearney were actually homeless men who had met at the Salvation Army. So Lawrence is in jail, and my sister drops me off at home more or less at the same time that Kearney gets home as well. Based on Kearney's accounts of what happened, he had turned Lawrence in himself, as he couldn't allow Lawrence to do what he was trying to do. Although I had appreciated his sacrifice, I still told Kearney that he would have to go, having been the overall cause of this. However, not wanting to leave the homeless man, well, homeless, I gave him until the end of the month to make another arrangement. Monday comes and after having completing staff meetings, I walk home to encounter a very much free Lawrence sitting on the sidewalk across my house watching it. I confront Lawrence as to why he's there and he tries to apologize before begging for money, rather out of character really. I dismissed him without giving him a cent. Now, I go back to the previous night. See, I had mentioned the staff meeting for a reason, as it was at this meeting where we had gotten a rather sizable list of liquor bottles that had gone missing from the storeroom, leaving us all suspecting each other. I, however, would not have to wait long to figure out who the real culprit was, as a few days later, I opened the garbage bin in my kitchen to see the missing bottles all empty and staring back at me. I decided to sit on this information for the time being, although I did photograph it all just in case, as I needed it for evidence later. I'd also called over Ben to inform him of the developments, as this was quickly becoming a detective game. We decided to enter Kearney's room to search for further evidence. Nothing of vast significance in there, with one exception, two single photographs of Lawrence. Before he had turned into the homeless version of Lex Luthor, 
Actually, there were several of Lawrence things still there. But as Lawrence had spent a lot of time there before the incident, I accepted this as normal. Now I should also add that I had mentioned Lawrence's release to Kearney, and had told him that if I even suspected that they were still seeing each other, I would throw him out of the house myself. Only a few days would pass before this came into play. On this particular night, I had been bartending again, and Kearney had constantly been stopping by the bar to help himself to draft glasses half full of wine and half full of coke, which he would go drink outside the restaurant. We confronted him about this, but as he correctly pointed out, he was still a manager, and we had no right to tell him what he could or couldn't do. On his fourth trip, however, I had grown suspicious and decided to follow him outside, where I encountered Lawrence sitting out sharing the half coke half wine concoction. This annoyed me. So the next day I returned to the restaurant with photographic evidence that I handed over to the general manager, who was also a friend of mine. Although I hadn't physically seen it, I had heard the confrontation through the office door when he fired Kearney. Kearney left obviously upset, and apparently had no idea that I had been the one who turned him in. So we had closed early that night and I was walking home, going past the high school. I saw Kearney coming from the opposite direction. He walked past me, literally only saying two words, I'm scared, before disappearing into the darkness. That would be the last time that I would ever physically lay my eyes on Comrade Schultz. So we reached the final week before Kearney's eviction was to take place. Ben had come to stay with me for that duration, as we both wanted to monitor the situation and make sure nothing else happened. It was in this week that Kearney's behavior suddenly changed. He was constantly smoking in his room, and his door was closed 24 seven. In fact, neither Ben nor I had caught so much of a peak of him in that entire week, which we hadn't thought much of at the time. The day of Kearney's eviction comes around, Ben had got home for a few hours, and I finally hear Kearney's bedroom door open. Someone walks out the room, opens the front door and leaves. I follow him outside, but somehow he's already completely vanished. What was left though were his house keys, indicating he obviously wasn't planning on returning. I look at the keys and notice something strange. Although the correct keys were on the keychain, there were also several that weren't mine. Why would he leave me all the wrong keys? His room was a shock, not because of the state it was in. The two had broken his bed in an act of wild monkiness, but I had already known about that. As I said, he never closed his doors. But more than that, he had literally left almost all his belongings behind, with one exception, the two photos of Lawrence. Upon further investigation, I suddenly realized that all traces of Lawrence ever being there had completely vanished, with all of Kearney's stuff left behind. There was one thing of Lawrence's left behind though, his duckling ringtone, which it turned out hadn't so much been a ringtone as an actual duckling, which now strolled around casually in the vacant bedroom. We called him Neville. So Ben returned and gets updated about the developments, both of us thinking the way he left was rather weird, of course, and the whole thing had been very strange. It was only when I asked the infamous question that this all becomes a conspiracy theory. Did you ever actually see Kearney in this week? It was to our shock that we realized neither of us had and suddenly started putting puzzle pieces together. The changing habits, Neville the duck, the wrong keys, only Lawrence's stuff being gone. It was to great discomfort that we both asked the question, who had really been living in our house this last week? During the last few days, Ben and I went on a mission, searching the town, crawling into drainpipes, trying to find any trace of Kearney's whereabouts, but they all added up to nothing. Comrade Schultz had simply vanished off the face of the earth. This wasn't the case with Lawrence though. He was still around, having made some new homeless friends. We encountered him several times, begging on the streets, and every time I asked him, where's Kearney? 
but he just acted like he'd never heard of him. The last time I would see Lawrence was across from work, attempting to break into a car. I called the police on him, and they arrived rather quickly, arresting him on the spot. While he was being led away by police, I shouted at him one last time, where's Kearney Lawrence? But he ignored me and let the cops drag him away. The next day I filed a missing persons report, as I thought Kearney was missing, and suggested that Lawrence may know something about it, but never came of it. So Lawrence, I don't know if you did something to Kearney or not, but if you did, let's not meet again. For those of you wondering what happened to Neville the Duck, we kept him for quite a while, but due to the malnourishment he received his first few months, he never grew and ultimately passed away. For those of you wondering what happened to the case, unfortunately, South Africa has a very unique way of closing cases. As in after a month or two, they just send you a text saying, case closed due to lack of evidence or case closed with no arrests. I didn't get one in this case, but did get one in an armed robbery I fell victim to in 2017. So not too helpful that they did much effort here. Regarding Lawrence, I saw him one more time after getting arrested. He was only locked up for about a week. After that though, he disappeared. I'm not sure if he left town or got arrested again. I live in Melbourne, and at the time I was living in a small flat near a popular street called Chapel Street that has a pretty busy nightlife. My flat was located about 100 meters off a main road, just behind a police station, a five minute walk away from the street. And due to this, I always felt relatively safe walking home alone from chapel after a big night out. So in order to tell this story, I have to go back a few months before the incident. I regularly shopped at the Woolworths just up the road from me and was approached by a Jamaican man one day after walking home from getting groceries. He began talking to me. He told me that he had seen me a few times at the supermarket and had always wanted to say hello. I was flattered and we struck up this innocent conversation about what it was like growing up in small towns and moving to a big city like Melbourne. He insisted on walking me home. This was a foolish mistake. I felt a bit uncomfortable about this, but didn't want to come off as rude. So I figured I would just wait till he was out of sight to go inside so that he wouldn't know which flat I lived in, as there were eight in total. He seemed like a nice guy. And when we reached my building, I said goodbye. And he asked for my number. I didn't really want to give it to him as I was already seeing someone, but I figured maybe he was just looking to make friends in the area. He messaged me the next day asking me to take me out on a date, and I politely declined and told him I had a boyfriend. That was the last I saw of him. At least, I thought. Fast forward seven months, and I'm walking home at 1.30am from a bar on Chapel Street. As I'm walking home, I see a guy in the distance walking towards me. I thought to myself, hmm, he looks familiar. As he got closer, I realized it was the Jamaican guy again. Just a weird coincidence, I thought. When he reached me, I said hello and expressed my surprise at bumping into him. This is when things begin to get really uncomfortable. He began telling me how he was at a bar with his friend when he saw me walk past. His friend, after discovering he knew me, told him to stop being such a baby and go talk to me. So this guy had jumped into his car, driven around the corner down the road and parked up ahead in order to catch me. This made me feel uneasy. Come have a drink with me, he said. I've already been out, I'm heading home, it's late. I really wanna just go to sleep, sorry. No, come on, come have a drink. He grabbed my hand. I gently pulled away and said, I'm really not interested in drinking anymore. I want to go home. Please come for a drink. 
This little dance went on for a good five minutes with him continually grabbing my hand and pulling me away. I thought he would get the hint. Then he changed his tactics. Let me walk you home. No, thank you. He argued this with me for a while, then started repeating, but I know where you live. I don't know how he thought this would magically make me trust him. It only succeeded in freaking me out. And at one point, I remember him saying, screw the police. I can't remember the exact context of this statement though. We argued for a good 15 to 20 minutes before I gave in, a little worried what would happen to me if I flat out told him to piss off. And he ended up walking with me. As we were nearing my building, I had decided I really should say something to get him to leave before he saw which flat I was in. Just as I was about to talk, he said he should go back to his friend. I was completely relieved, but still shaken. He asked for my number again, and I didn't want to say no because I knew he wouldn't take it. And I didn't know if he would get aggressive. If I gave him a fake one, he could test it out before I left. I have had that happen in the past. So I complied. And as soon as he was out of sight, I ran to my flat, locked the door and proceeded to check all the windows were secured. I lived with a boy who worked in the casino and was hoping that he would be home that night. I was very upset to find out he was not. And I called my housemate terrified and told him what had happened and asked when he would be home. He told me he wouldn't be back for another four hours due to night shift and to call the police if he came back knocking on the door. The guy messaged me about an hour after saying how good it was to see me again and then text me in the morning too. After calming down and gathering my strength, I replied to him saying that the way he had approached me had made me quite uncomfortable and that I would appreciate being left alone. Haven't heard from him since. He's probably not a dangerous guy. I just hope he learnt not to approach women that way after our encounter. It may not sound like much of an ordeal to you, but if you'd have been there and seen everything from your own eyes, you'd have been pretty terrified as well. This event happened 20 years ago, when I was nine years old. My family took a ski trip to West Virginia, a ski resort. My dad really wanted to get his money worth. So he had my whole family come out on the slopes about 20 minutes before the lifts were even running. It was something like 15 degrees and around lunchtime. My mum and I were getting too cold to have fun. So we decided to get hot chocolate at the food hall while my dad and brother and I stayed out for a few more advanced runs and all agreed to meet for lunch about an hour later. My mum and I got our hot chocolate and were warming up in the food hall when I got a second wind. The kiddie slope was right outside the building. So I asked my mum if I could do a few runs while waiting for my dad and brother to return. My mum was usually extremely cautious about letting my brother and I do things on our own. But from where she was sitting, she had a view of the slopes through the window and probably for that reason said okay. At first, everything was fine. I was thrilled to be out on my own and I felt invincible, blasting down an easy slope after the trickier ones I'd been on with my parents. I went down a few times and was feeling good when I started to notice myself passing a specific man over and over. This man was very distinctive looking in the crowd of skiing families wearing 90s style snow gear, tall, wearing what appeared to be a black trench coat, not a ski jacket, with a long dark beard and dark rimmed glasses and a black hat with a rim. As a nine year old, his appearance kind of scared me a bit, a bit like a cartoon villain. And I began to feel like I was seeing him everywhere. It wasn't a huge slope, but it still seemed like we passed each other more often than I was passing other skiers. I also started getting the sense that he was trying to get on the lift with me, like waiting to get in line until after I did. Even though we never ended up being put on a lift together, I couldn't tell if I was being paranoid or if he really was showing up way too often. So I decided to test him. 
The next time I got off the lift, I went back down the slopes like normal, knowing he had been on a few chairs behind me, and would probably come right down the slope as well. When I was about halfway down the hill, I stopped suddenly and the man passed me. That's when it started getting weird. After passing me, the man went a little way further down the hill and gently fell down in a controlled way. He sat on the ground and watched me pass him, and then immediately got back up and skied the rest of the way down the hill, getting in line for the lift. Several people behind me. I don't know what he said, but he spoke to each of the people that were in line between him and me, and managed to get right behind me as I was about to go on the lift. Right as the chair came around, he got up beside me and tried to get on the lift with me. At the last second, I played dumb and said, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, and stepped back to let him on. He seemed surprised by what I said, but got on alone, and I got on the next lift with a mum and her daughter instead. They were really nice and I had a good chat with them on the way up the hill. For some reason, I was too stupid and shaken up to tell them about the man. I was hoping it would look like they were my family or at least someone else on the slope that was paying attention to me. At this point, I felt pretty sure that this creepy man had singled me out, and years of my parents saying stranger danger and that training told me that it was probably time to find my mum. I resolved to ski back down to the food hall as soon as I got to the top. Instead, I got off the lift, said goodbye to the mum and daughter, and was immediately approached by the man who clearly waited for me at the top. He came right over to me and said, Are you all alone, little girl? It's funny to think back now, but at the time I remember being kind of insulted at this question because it sounded so much like all the cheesy lines my parents would come up with when they taught my brother and I about stranger danger. I couldn't believe this guy could think of a less obvious question to ask, or that he actually referred to me as little girl instead of pretending to know me, or something less conspicuous. I think his audacity in that regard kept me from being as afraid as I otherwise may have been. It made it seem like a game or simulation, which probably helped me act more natural. I answered him in a very matter-of-fact way, saying that I wasn't all alone, and pointed to a nearby man and his teenage son, saying that that was my dad and brother. Then I walked away very casually, as if I wasn't at all weirded out by his question, and skied down the hill to the food hall where I quickly found my mum. I told her all about the guy, and the weirdness, and while I was telling her, I saw him come inside and start walking around with his head high, clearly scanning the crowd like he was looking for someone. My mum was really freaked out and didn't let me leave again, even to get food. My dad and brother arrived soon after that, and my mum told my dad the story. He brushed it off as someone probably being awkward but trying to look out for me, but my mum wasn't too convinced and neither was I. I think about that guy every now and then, and wonder what was really going on with him, why he was dressed so unusually, and unseasonably while skiing. Why was he only skiing on the kiddie slopes when he didn't seem to be with a family? Why did he notice me at all? All that I do know is that I never want to see him again. This takes place in a very small town in Western Kentucky. As in one flashing caution light, blink, and you'll miss it. There is a two lane highway that runs between this town and a large college town about 15 minutes away. At the time this story takes place, the highway was shut down for a few days for repaving in the very small town. Also, I was 20 years old and four months pregnant. I was working in a convenience store that only sold tobacco products and lottery tickets. I normally worked the day shift, but due to another employee's scheduling conflict, I was closing that day by myself. One of my regular customers had left about five minutes prior to closing. After I saw him pull out of the parking lot, I walked over to the door to lock it. It's also important to note that there were absolutely no other vehicles besides my own in the parking lot. Before I could turn the lock, two armed men dressed in all black, including full face masks, rushed the door and pushed it open, 
ordering me back to the register area to empty it as well as the separate lottery machine and register. I emptied both of these into a plastic bag. The guy carried a shotgun, ordered me to the back room where the safe was and had me empty this as well. At this point, I began hyperventilating and was trying to cover my pregnant belly with one arm, all the while trying to throw the cash and rolled coins into the bag. The man grew impatient and pushed me backwards into the wall, grabbing the cash that I had dropped. The second man came into the back room, aiming his firearm at me and shouted at me to stay back there and slammed the door shut while they ran out the front door. I had fallen to the ground after hitting the wall. So when I heard the front door close, I crawled to the door to the back room and cracked it open to be sure they were gone. After confirming this, I ran to the front door, locked it, then ran back to the counter where our phone is. My hands were shaking so badly. I could hardly dial, but managed to call the owner of the store, who called the police. Due to the shutdown highway, it took them about 20 minutes to arrive along with an ambulance. I gave my statement, the police called in their K9 units to attempt to track the men since they had obviously fled on foot. But as far as I know, they were never caught. I was in shock. So my boss called my now ex husband and asked me to come pick me up. There was no way I would be able to drive myself. The jerk was with his friends playing video games and refused. Thankfully, his son was able to drive me home. And I sat in our empty house for three hours before he came home. I was jumping at every little sound and was a nervous wreck when he did finally return. Ultimately, I had to go to the hospital because of the stress causing me to go into early labor. Thankfully, they were able to stop the contractions and my daughter made her appearance four months later. Fun fact. When my daughter was three, I was speaking about this to her preschool teacher and she said, Yeah, I heard the whole thing. It was scary. She's now 12 and insists that she remembers this. When I was 11, I lived very close to one of my friends called Anne. She had a little brother named Matt. During summer vacation, me, Anne and Matt would always hang out pretty much every day. Anne lived right across next to this little bridge that went over the train tracks next to her house. Right over the bridge, there was a road that went down to this facility and then connected to the main road. I'm not entirely sure what this building's purpose was exactly, but it was some sort of financial advisement building. Since we were curious kids, we would sometimes go snoop around there and we found this shed right behind it. This was an epic find for us as it became our clubhouse. There was pretty much nothing in there but rusty nails and it was always unlocked for some reason, but we thought it was cool and we would meet there almost every day and just hang out, even if there was nothing special to see there. Now one day, I had come to Anne's house and we were heading down to our clubhouse as usual. Then out of the blue, this random man comes out of nowhere and starts walking towards us. It's obvious we were going inside the shed. Matt's hand is on the doorknob. I'm the eldest of us, Sam being a year younger than me and Matt three years younger than I. So I was sort of the leader. What are you doing? He asks. He seemed mad for some reason. Of course, we had no explanation. We were kids that didn't understand private property and had just found this cool shed to hang out in. Nothing is the only thing I could utter. He starts lecturing us about it not being okay and kept talking about the important things in there and that we weren't allowed to go in. He made it seem as though he worked there, even though he'd just come from the opposite direction of the facility. I now realize he was rambling, but it seemed very justified to us because we were scared as hell. It was just weird because I knew that the building was closed. It was Sunday afternoon and all the lights were off, but he spoke with such authority we just listened in straight up fear. He then started demanding we come with him and starts walking further down the street, saying he's going to call the cops. If we don't come with him right now, we're scared out of our minds and just follow this grown up thinking we've committed some sort of serious crime. He leads us to his house and we kind of stop outside because we've been lectured about going with a stranger 
and all that since we learned to talk. So it felt wrong. And we were hesitating outside and holding her brother's shoulder warily. Our savior then comes she's walking her dog. She doesn't even say anything. I don't even think she saw him. But he just closed the door when he saw someone coming. I remember his face so well when he saw this random woman. We were so scared we just ran home immediately after he shut that door and never crossed the bridge again. This situation still gives me chills to this day. I lived in a sketchy part of the neighborhood. But I had never had a job outside other than helping my mum. So I was very naive and gullible at the time. I was out of high school and looking for work. I had worked with my mum junior to senior year cleaning houses. But I wanted to work somewhere else and gain some outside experience. When I had graduated high school, my mum and I decided it was time to look for another job because I needed some money for college. My mum loved to read newspapers and we would get a Spanish newspaper called Mundo Hispanico every single week. I would look through it once in a while to read the comics or see job ads at the end. One evening, I was so determined to find an ad that paid well, and was something else that would give me another set of working skills. I was going through the classified section at the end of the newspaper, when I found what I thought to be the perfect job for me. I don't remember word for word. But it was something along the lines of looking for young females ages 18 to 25 for an open massage position at this location. Now, the location was 0.3 miles away from where I stayed. So I thought it was perfect. I could walk to and from without having to worry about transportation, since we only had one car. Massage training will be provided. And the pay is handsomely good. Our girls can earn anywhere from $500 to 900 a week. I thought, whoa, what a great wage. I can pay off my college in no time. I was so excited that I fit the profile. And I showed the job to my mum. My mum wasn't excited like I was. And she told me that it looked a tad suspicious that I should call first to see if there really was another person on the other end. So I did. And the lady answered. I asked her about the free training. How much do you really make? And where the location was exactly? She seemed very sweet on the phone and told me before we move forward, they were doing interviews and already had other candidates on their list. She said that I could come in for an interview to see if I would make it to the second round. I agreed. She gave me the address and I looked it up. When I saw it was 0.3 miles from my apartment. I was so happy. I told my mum that I would be going to the interview at a set time at this location and alone. She told me there was no way I would be going alone. And she would come with me. I was so mad because I wanted to do this by myself without having her help me. Because in my little mind, I thought I was all grown up and didn't need help from her. The day came and she drove us in the only car we had. Now the address the lady gave near me was weird because it took us to a motel behind the shopping plaza that was next to our apartment. It didn't make sense why they would have an interview there. So we just circled the plaza looking for the place. My mum became frustrated. And they told me they were in one of the motel rooms. And they were there because it was a safety precaution. It seemed to make sense to me at the time. I told her I could not find the place. So if she could please speak to my mother and tell her exactly where it was. You're with your mother? Her voice changed from a sweet, almost apologetic tone 
to an angry and panicky one. Yeah, I am with her right now because she's driving me. So I passed the phone to my mum. She said, hello, hello. The lady had hung up on her. I called twice more, but she never picked up the phone. I was angry that the lady had just hung up. And so we went back home. I never put two and two together until about three years later, when I heard on the news that there was a newspaper job that had been busted and the people were charged with trafficking. The ad was very similar to the one I had read years ago. I thanked my mum over and over because if it wasn't for her, I could have been dead or trafficked multiple times. I don't know where I would have ended up. I'm so grateful for my mum, despite me being angry at her for coming with me. Because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. I grew up around the world. My parents were divorced and they had joint custody. So I lived every other year with the other parent. But their jobs required them to move every one to three years to a whole new country. So I'd usually only stay in one place for a year or two. I moved to India in 1995 as a freshman. This was the largest school I'd ever been to. I was fat, pimply and scared of the new school. I'd always been good at making friends. But this school was harder. Most of them lived here their whole life. So it's hard to break into those circle of friends. But a large portion was similar to me. Kids that moved often, although not as frequent. So they weren't as receptive to new kids either. Every fall, we did something at the school called a mini course, where everyone in high school had to sign up for a five day field trip. There were tons. It was a big school and seniors got priority, of course. Some trips were like sailing the Ganges or hiking some mountain or riding trains to Agra. I can't remember except the two I went on. In freshman year, I went rafting the Ganges. It's exactly what it sounds like. Six kids in a raft with an experienced rafter and we went down different portions of the Ganges and camped in tents. There were two sophomores, RJ and Steve, and they were snooty rich kids, pompous and arrogant. They seemed to take a real liking to picking on me. I'd been picked on before, but this was rough. One morning they tied my clothes together and threw it in the water, tied it to a branch and stuff like that. The chaperone was kind of a jerk too. He asked me who did it and I said, well, if I can't prove it, what does it matter? And he said, that's what I want to hear. I mean, he had heard and witnessed the harassment and never intervened. I was never one to tattle. That's just not something I was raised to do. Anyway, it sucked. The rest of the year, I didn't have any problems. But every time I saw these two, they always did or said something that just upset me were just general bullies, slapping my lunch out my hand, unzipping my bag so my books would fall out that kind of stuff. Over the summer, I hit a growth spurt, went on diet and shot up five inches in six months. And with good food and exercise, I was looking pretty good. I even made the basketball team as a sophomore. The coach was the chaperone from the previous mini course, funnily enough, and I had some more friends. RJ and Steve were always into weed, but now I think they were into some other stuff. They looked different next year, acted differently, meaner, generally irritable. They still tried to pick on me, but when I used to walk away, I could feel like they thought they had won. And now I could tell that walking away annoyed them and made them angrier. The mini course came around and coach wanted me on cycling some mountain ranges or something like that. And he thought it would be good for my conditioning. So I went and sure enough, RJ and Steve were on the trip as well. I had the room next to them at the hotel and it reeked of weed the entire time. Then we'd go and ride some portions of the hills, then back again, and they'd be smoking. At dinner and stuff, they would make jokes about me, and I kept ignoring them until one of the seniors berated them for being bullies. They loved it. They laugh, 
and really I think they just loved the attention. Going up to my room, I saw them in the hallway, and they threatened me that if I told the chaperone that they were smoking weed, they'd stab me. And I said, haven't told them yet. Why would I do it now? Next morning, I was going to hang back and pick up stragglers since I was riding pretty well. Usually, it was some freshman or less athletic kid in the back. This time it was RJ and Steve. I slowed down for them and told them we only had 10 minutes to get to the stop. Steve, in response, threw a stick at my wheel, then they both sped off laughing. It didn't do anything, but they were laughing as they went around the corner and out of sight. Then I heard, oh sh- and stop. As I came around, I saw them both falling off the mountain and into the trees. I slowed down, looked over the edge, and I could see a branch poking through RJ's arm. He was looking up at me, then down, then up, very confused, and I couldn't see Steve. For a reason not known to me today, I didn't do anything. I kept riding. I don't know why. I was raised to always do the right thing and help people, but at that moment, I felt like they deserved it. I know they didn't, but I thought they did for some reason. It was a real battle in my head. I got to the top of the mountain and the chaperone asked if everyone was okay. I said, I think so, but I didn't see Steve or RJ. I was still unsure why I lied. It was a strange sensation. It was so natural to me. I didn't even feel like I was saying it. The chaperone rode back down the mountain to find them. The other chaperone guided us back to the route we were doing. When we got back to the hotel, they were loading RJ and Steve into a van. This was about two hours later. It wasn't an ambulance. I guess the van was faster. They were bloodied and black in some spots. Steve, whose whole head was wrapped, and when he leaned forward, blood would pour onto his nose like a faucet. Then the Indian guy would push his head back, and I looked right at RJ and didn't say a word. He was on morphine or something was completely out of it. There was so much blood on his pants and shirt. They both came back after Christmas break. RJ before Steve. RJ's arm was still in a cast and his foot was in a boot. Steve had a scar between his eyes where he fractured his skull. It was pretty bad. Something you don't forget. His skull didn't look like it set right. Like it had shifted but it wasn't as noticeable as his scar. I heard them talking to girls sometimes, saying how the morphine felt so good, and that they should switch over to that. In general, they didn't seem to act all that different. Anyway, a number of years later, now in my adult life, one of these pair actually wound up getting a job at a company that our company had just acquired. When I was talking to my VP, they told me that one of the pair had actually wanted to talk to me, as when they went down, they were expecting to see me. Anyway, I obviously didn't have any intention of going over and seeing what he wanted. And I, for the most part, tried to put it to the back of my mind. Then in 2015, I had to go over to the acquired business for some work. And the thought hit me. And I thought that maybe I'd just pop in to see what it was that he wanted to ask me three years ago. But when I spoke to the project manager, they told me that he had a plan not to get fired, and that he'd made a real mess over at the company. I mean, his firing was inevitable. And once he did, he went off the rails, got back into drugs and ended his own life. I tracked him down on LinkedIn and Facebook, and it was true, he had passed. I do wonder though, what his plan to not get fired was. Was it perhaps trying to apologize to me? Who knows? I lived really close to my school when I was a kid and there was this big thing for us to play in. So naturally, I always went to play there in the evening before supper, or just any time I was bored. It was surrounded by a lot of houses and a busy street. 
so it was a safe enough place. One day, I went with a friend of mine who was about a year older than me. We had two schoolyards, one for the older kids and one for the younger ones. The big plastic thing was in the younger kids' yard. There was a small corridor that let us go between yards, and as we were playing, I see this guy wearing a hoodie, with the hood up, slowly start to walk into the yard we were in. We stayed there for about 20 minutes with the guy, but I felt something was off. I was too young to really know what to do, and imagined he would leave at some point. The problem was that he was slowly walking around a wall blocking all the houses from seeing him, and was much closer to the exit than we were. I will always remember watching him nonchalantly kick a pizza box round as he made his way closer. As I turned to my friend to tell her that we had to leave, because I felt like there was something really bad that was going to happen, I heard my father bellow my name and saw him running the length of the schoolyard towards the door with my neighbor in tow. My father was in his 60s and took his car everywhere, and that was the first time I saw him really run. The guy bolted, and my father trailed after him. My neighbor brought us to my friend's house, as they all knew each other, and we stayed there until pretty late. I remember her mother trying to explain to us exactly who that person was and I was terrified. My father, my neighbor, and my friend's father both tried to find the guy. I can imagine how scared they must have been. He's quite tall and intimidating along with the neighbors. The scariest part is that I still have no idea how my father knew, as the guy wasn't visible, and I lived a few houses down from where we were. I'm sure that he saved mine and my friend's life that day. A few years ago, I went to a motel with a few friends. There was a restaurant right in front of the hotel. It was literally in the same parking lot. My friend and I, us both being girls, went to the resto bar around 2am. It was open 24-7, and some of our guy friends waited for us a bit further in the parking lot. We couldn't see them from the inside though. We get to the resto bar, and I feel a creepy vibe right away. There was only one employee, a girl in her mid-twenties, and us, 18-year-old girls and a creepy dude sitting at the bar. The guy looked up at us, up and down with a smirk. The girl was just standing there, stiff as hell. At some point she said, That's it, I'm calling the police. My friend and I looked at each other, confused. The guy got up and got closer to her. He was about to follow her to the back store, but she put her phone up to her ear and he backed off. My friend and I started walking to the door. I wanted to scream to my guy friends to come and help, but we didn't get the chance because the creepy dude ran after us. Long story short, we found ourselves in between the resto doors and the exit doors. The girl still on the phone ran and locked us out of her restaurant. The guy blocked the exit door with his body. He started saying stuff like, you girls are so hot, it makes me want to do stuff, and things like that. After what felt like hours, the police got there and arrested the guy. We got out of there, and they asked us a few questions and that was that. We went back to our guy friend, who had no clue what happened. My friend and I, both females, met up first time back home from college. It was a surprisingly nice day outside in the middle of winter, so we decided to get lunch and eat outside. We found a park that had no one there, and we were sitting at a picnic table catching up, when I see a scruffy looking guy in a large work van with no rear windows pull up into the parking lot. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him at first, but I noticed he was moving around the outside of the van for a bit, and he kept looking our way. He finally walked down the sidewalk towards us, and passed by our picnic table, and walked around the back side of the restroom building to look down the hill on the other side of it. 
very obviously casing out the place. He walked back to his van, and me and my friend were discussing what we were going to do while I watched him open up the back of the van and begin to dig around it. He made a call on his cell phone, and a few minutes later, another male pulled up in a different car. He got out and started talking to the first guy, who not very discreetly pointed in our direction. They immediately began walking towards us, and my friend and I scooped what was left of lunch and fast walked out of that place while keeping an eye on them. One of the times in my life, I could literally feel the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. It could have been nothing, but even now I feel pretty certain that they had something planned, and I'm glad that we left. I was just in Cuba with my family, and we took a tour of the city. There were people asking for things which was completely fine, but there was one man who was quite clearly drunk off his ass, swaying and carrying around a beer. He was being very aggressive and standing right up close to us, poking us for things. It escalated to the point he started grabbing at my sister's baby when he was feeding him. So I got in the way and stopped him. There was an extremely kind Cuban lady who stayed with us and told the guy off. Extremely kind, considering our tour guide was nowhere in sight. The man proceeded to yell at her, and then began ripping wiring out of a garden, and was trying to hotwire two 220 volt wires, which was our cue to get the hell away from him. I'm extremely grateful for that lady, and watching over my family and making sure that he stayed away. He even got pictures with her and made sure to give her a large sum of pesos as a thanks. I'm a 23 year old male from the UK. And like everyone, I have a story to tell. And this one is 100% true. But first, allow me to put things into some context. At the time of the events in this story, I was 13. In fact, I had only turned 13 weeks prior to the following event. This happened to be my hometown, a small coastal town on the southwest coast of England a place where I no longer live. I moved, not because of the memory of these events, but because of work and my love life. On the night these events began, my group of neighborhood friends and I gathered, like we always did, to play a game called Manhunt. It's a bit like hide and seek, but when the Manhunter catches you, you join his or her team. There are two other types of ways to play this game. There's flashlight manhunt, where the manhunters use flashlights to catch you. And if they keep you in the flashlight beam long enough to count to five, you're on their team. And then there's torture manhunt. This one, you would catch hold of one of the hiders and beat them a little until they gave in. Thankfully, none of us ever went that far. The worst I've ever got was a kick to the balls and the worst the girls in our group ever got was a light bear hug. The torture for them was being hugged by us guys, as we had for the most part all grown up together, so they give in because of the awkwardness more than anything. We played two games of Manhunt on our housing estate, which is basically the UK's government version of government provided housing for families on low income, all lumped together on land that is useless for anything else. We played these games from around 6.30 in the evening to 7.45. We all sat in the estate park after these games. It was pitch black at the time in the evening, and this was the middle of November, it getting dark early. We were all of varying ages. The oldest of the group who lived next door to me was 15 years old, Joey. Joey had heard on the news that there was supposed to be a meteor shower that would be clearly visible in the sky later on that night, between the hours of 10.30 and 2 in the morning. He suggested that we go and watch it. We all danced around the idea for a while, and then one of the girls, Amy, decided to jump up and suggest to ask our parents if we could all go as a group. None of us were sure if our parents would let us go and figured it wasn't worth asking. But she pointed out that Joey and the oldest girl of the group, Lexi, who was 14, 
both had cell phones, and both of them had all our parents' numbers from when we all hung out together, and our parents needed to get a hold of us. This was back in 2008. Not all kids had cell phones back then like they do now, and even if they did, they were lucky to have anything that resembled a cell phone of today. After Amy said that, we all jumped up and began to run home to our parents, begging to be allowed to stay out and watch the meteor shower. It was a Friday night, so there was no school the next day. Joey and Lexi stayed in the park and called their parents from there. I walked with my then boyfriend, Callum. I'm bisexual and have known for some time at this point. He was 13 and had only been 13 for a short period of time, as he had his birthday two weeks after mine. We'd started dating each other three months after he and his family had moved, six months before these events. He'd asked me out. He was thin, had a mop of shaggy black hair with pale skin and was shorter than me. With brown eyes, your heart could get lost in. I was only 13 and never had a boyfriend. I had one girlfriend, but that didn't last, nor did we get serious, so of course I said yes. He too was bisexual, but he didn't want to tell people about us, as he felt it would be weird for both of us to like girls and each other, and he felt like no one would understand. Believe it or not, things weren't as politically correct back then, nor were people as accepting. There was still a lot of homophobia around, in our town at least, and especially in our high school. We walked slowly down the hill to our street from the park, just talking about what we had done in our English class at school that day. When we rounded the corner to begin walking down the street, Callum stopped and grabbed my hand. I was confused. It was the first piece of affection he had shown for me all night, and it was in a public place, which wasn't like him at all. I looked up at him and saw him staring off up the street ahead of us just beyond the turning to the street we lived on. In a patch of grass was a street lamp. He was looking at the street light. Can you see him? He asked, his voice trembling a little. What? I said, and looked at the street light. And he was right, just beyond the glow of the light cast by the street light. A man was standing in the shadows. He just stood there, not facing us at first, but he must have become aware that we were staring at him, as in the light we saw him turn to face us. I could feel his eyes on me, looking right at me. I felt like they were looking into my very soul, and Callum's grip on my hand grew tighter. I then noticed the orange slash red circle where his mouth would have been. He stepped forward into the light, blowing a cloud of smoke from his mouth. He didn't say anything, but carried on staring. Do you think he knows Jake? Callum asked me. Jake was a guy who lived in the house that the guy was stood next to. Jake was in college, and it was common knowledge that he was a pot dealer, a mum with no morals. He even tried to sell it to me and Callum once. He seemed to be one of the only two people on our estate who guessed we were a couple, as he called us lovebirds when he tried to get us to buy pot from him. Jake was a strange guy, but was harmless enough. He was pretty much a hippie. I don't know. I said to Callum, maybe? Although this guy under the streetlight didn't look like the type of person Jake would hang out with. This guy wore a dark, full-body tracksuit and a baseball cap. The guy stuffed out his cigarette against the metal post of the streetlight, chucked it to the floor, and walked towards Jake's house, disappearing behind the hedge that led to his backyard. I heard a sigh of relief from Callum. I'm so glad you were with me then, he said, squeezing my hand. Let's go, I say. Yeah, he replied. Although we weren't telling anyone about our relationship and not being affectionate in public, we walked down our street holding each other's hands, only stopping when he let go to walk into his house and I to mine. We didn't think to tell anyone about the creepy guy with the cigarette. All of our parents said that we could go watch the meteor shower, so long as no one drank any alcohol. But of course, 
When you tell kids that age not to do something, it's a sure bet they are gonna do what they were told not to. We all met up at the park after getting confirmation from our parents and decided to go to the top of the hill called Duckett's Hill, as it was a well-known landmark. Not for any special reason, it just had a very good view of the marshland that surrounds it. We walked to Duckett's Hill and settled on the top. Joey and a friend of ours called Tyler started a bonfire as it was cold, and it was a chance to have a real kids only get together. Amy and her older sister Faye had taken four bottles of some cheap nasty wine from their parents wine cooler and decided that we all needed to drink some. I decided not to because I felt like someone needed to keep an eye on the fire with a sober eye. And I had this horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach that the creepy cigarette guy could turn up and start watching us. As we waited for the time to go by, we all sat around the fire Joey had built up, passing the wine bottles from one person to the next, all of us taking a sip each time except for me. I passed it on to Callum, who sat unusually close to me in front of our friends. He was so close, he could rest his head against my shoulder, and if the wind was in the right direction, I could smell him, a mix of Lynx Africa deodorant and the cherry scented clothes detergent his mother's used to wash their clothes. It's a smell I'll never forget. Somehow we got onto the subject of who in the group would make a good couple. This left me and Callum a little uncomfortable as you can imagine. We'd been secretly dating for three and a half months and we'd only made it to third base. And our relationship was, as all relationships are at that age, pretty fragile. Amy, who was 12 and the youngest of the group, Tyler, Faye, Callum and me were all 13, pointed at me and said, so who would you date out of the girls here? I look around at everyone sheepishly. I don't know, I said shrugging. Everyone groaning in disappointment, even Callum did. I later found out he was genuinely interested in who I would be dating in our group if not him. Before I could show my nervousness, I blurted out, I mean, you're all pretty hot. It would be hard to choose. This was a lie. They were all pretty hot, but I'd thought about asking Faye out a month before Callum moved in across the street from me. She was almost 14 and was a very hot emo chick. All of us in that group were skateboarding emo types, although me and Callum were the only guys who didn't have the typical emo hairstyle. Mine was just dead straight and shoulder length hair. His, as I mentioned, was long but shaggy. He still had a way to go before it got to my length. I had had a crush on her, but when I tried to ask her, I got too nervous and bottled out, mainly because I couldn't get her alone to ask her. Amy was hanging out with us at the time, and I had to hype myself into asking her again, but by the time that happened, Callum had moved in, and my world changed forever. Everyone groaned at my answer, even Callum, who made a joke about me wanting to date all of the girls in the group and being a man whore. I can't remember what he said exactly, but I know he put an arm around my shoulder and pulled me close so he could screw up my hair. You know, Lexi said, you and Callum would make a cute couple. And then added, we could use a gay couple to bring some sassiness to the group. Callum sheepishly laughed and said, yeah, good one before gently pushing me back to how I was sitting before he grabbed me. I stoked the fire and stood up. I needed to pee. So I walked away from the fire to the crest of the hilltop. I didn't go far in total darkness. I stood close enough to the fire and they could still see me, but far enough away to have privacy. I started staring at the hill as I relieved myself when I noticed something I had seen earlier a circular orange red glow from the lighted tip of a cigarette. My urine flow stopped mid pee. The man from the street lamp was back. He was at a distance away, but close enough that all I could see of him was the tip of his lit cigarette. His eyes were on me again. I could feel them bearing into me. A light emerged where the guy's hands would have been. It was like a small flashlight. He whirled the letters C, U in the air, and then it switched off. 
The cigarette fell to the floor and I could just about hear the sound of him making his way through the tall, knee-height meadow grass as he walked away down the other side of the hill. Once he was gone, I carried on my business. From behind me, I heard Joey call out to stop touching myself, which of course made everyone laugh, even me, although it was nervous laughter. I returned to the circle around the fire, not knowing whether I should warn the others or not. I looked at Callum's side on. I just took him in for a moment. His button nose, his eyes, his noticeable but not too prominent cheekbones. He had a pretty face for a boy, although it was clear he would grow up to be a handsome and chiseled young man. He seemed to be relaxed and happy, so I decided not to ruin it and keep what I saw to myself, a decision I would later come to regret. We carried on talking for a while. After two of the four bottles of wine had been drunk, someone, I can't remember who, suggested that we roll down the hill in the dark. Everyone has rolled down a hill as a kid. And for some reason in everyone's tipsy state, doing it in the dark was an amusing prospect. Joey decided to stay at the fire to keep an eye on it, letting the rest of us roll down the hill. Callum had never consumed alcohol to this level before and was a lightweight. It had gone to his head a bit too quickly. He wasn't massively drunk, but he couldn't quite walk without staggering a little, and he didn't want to roll alone. So he grabbed a hold of me, pushed me down to the ground, straddled me, and we rolled down the hill. It was a weird moment for me. I knew the creepy cigarette guy was out there, but in the arms of the boy I loved, so there was a sense of joy there too. When we got to the bottom of the hill and stopped rolling, he didn't get up right away. He kissed me. I kissed him back, but before we could make out or anything, we heard heavy footsteps behind us, moving amongst the grass. We both shot up and ran up the hill, neither of us saying anything to each other. The third bottle of wine came out and passed between us all again. This time I took my one and only sip for the night. Callum took a few gulps. I leaned in and told him not to drink any more because he wouldn't be able to hold his drink. He nodded and stopped. As it turned out, my warning about him drinking came too late. He was swaying and staggering hard as he walked when we left later. I kept my eyes peeled for Cigarette Guy, but cannot recall seeing him again while we were there. The clouds in the sky hadn't cleared, and the meteors should have been flying over us. It was 11.30, and we decided it was too cold and we were all too tired, and that it was best that we went home. We put the fire out, switched the flashlights on, and walked along the path that we had used to get to the hilltop, back to the road. For some reason, as we stepped onto the sidewalk, Callum decides that he wants to go to our estate's local store, which was open until midnight on Friday and Saturday nights. He wanted to grab something to eat. I tried to get the others to come with us, but they wouldn't. I have no idea why. It was known in the group that me and Callum were close, but I always assumed that the others didn't know how close I could have been wrong. But even today, I still think that Lex had a suspicion about mine and Callum's relationship. I thought it back then too. She just seemed to drop hints here and there that she knew what we were keeping to ourselves. This was reinforced to me that night as her parting words for us were, boys have fun, just play safe, which made us laugh, of course. To get to the local store from where we were, we left the group and we had to walk down a hill that was normally full of traffic during the day. But at this time of night, it was as quiet as a back end country road. We walked slowly on the sidewalk, my arm around Callum's waist. I was holding him up and we were alone now, and he would have staggered into the road otherwise. When we reached the bottom of the hill, he had to stop. He said his head was spinning. He leant forward into the road, his hands clasped around his knees, and began to retch and throw up. I told you you wouldn't be able to handle your liquor, I said. He half turned and flipped the bird at me. I laughed. I looked up at the top of the hill to see if anyone was there and there wasn't. 
Callum threw up once more and stood up, wiping his mouth with his sleeve. I was looking up at the top of the hill, when he grabbed my arm and started pulling me along the sidewalk. What's up? I asked him. Look behind you, he said. It was the creepy cigarette guy from earlier. He was stood under two large oak trees that stood at the entrance to the small side street that had about eight houses on it across the road, where Callum had thrown up. The field where the fire was, right next to this little street. Hey boys, the man said, in an accent that gave away where he was from. I grabbed a hold of Callum, picking him up practically and started running. As I said earlier, he was shorter than me and a lot lighter in weight. I had to put him down as we reached the store though. He got heavy after a short time, but we kept on running. We didn't have to run before we reached our housing estate. We had to pass the estate next to ours, and then we would be at the end of the road leading into the one that our streets belonged to. We kept darting, looking over our shoulders behind us, and the cigarette guy was jogging after us at a leisurely pace, as if to keep a safe distance, almost like he was toying with us. Once we reached the road that led onto the estate, Callum started freaking out. He wasn't hysterical, but had tears running down his face. I'm scared, he told me. I always thought I would be a cool headed and cocky type of person in these situations, but I wasn't. And I had to admit that I was scared too. I'd never been so scared, nor have I been. Me too, I replied. We reached the turn into our streets, and like idiots, we stopped to catch our breath. I think Callum wanted to stop crying before we went to his house. I was staying there that night. We had become friends the day he moved in, and it was like my second home. Sometimes I spent more time there than at my house with my mum and two sisters. I was over there so much, I even had my own toothbrush, bath towel, and two changes of clothes. I hugged Callum to try and keep him calm. There was no one around and frankly at that point I didn't care if anyone found us hugging. I was just glad to be alive and away from Cigarette Guy. I looked down to the entrance to our estate and the Cigarette Guy was there again. So we ran across the grass verge that went along the top of our street and down to Callum's house. The house was all in darkness. His mum has not stayed up with us. We knew this was a possibility, but we hadn't expected it. Callum was struggling to get his keys from the pocket of his skinny jeans. That's a bit of a horror movie cliche, I know, but it's the truth. I looked up to the entrance of our street and he was there. Cigarette guy was just standing there. It was so cold, you could see the breath steaming from his mouth. I shook Callum and told him to look. The guy raised a hand and waved a slow camp wave with his finger. Callum looked at the keys and found the right one, opened the front door as quietly as possible and we crept inside, locked it behind us and went upstairs. We went to the bathroom to relieve ourselves and brush our teeth. Callum cleaned himself up a little bit. He had a bit of puke on his chin. Then we went into Callum's room. We got undressed into our underwear and into the separate beds. Callum had bunk beds. He was on the top, I bottom. We would do this when I slept over in case his mum or sister came into the bedroom so they wouldn't catch us in the same bed. After they had been in bed for an hour though, I would climb up the ladder and get into bed with Callum. We spent the next 20 minutes talking about Cigarette Guy and what he could have wanted from us. I couldn't think of a single reason he would have for wanting to talk to two 13 year old boys in a small coastal town in that area of the UK, using kids as drug runners is as rare as unicorns. So non-existent. I don't want to be by myself, babe, Callum said. I climbed down the ladder and got into bed with him. We talked for a while longer and tried to take our minds off creepy cigarette guy. At around 6.30, Callum woke me up, shaking me violently. I looked at him as if to say, what the hell? But he wasn't looking at me. He was pointing at his bedroom window. He looked terrified. I looked to where he was pointing, but the blind was down. 
and on top of that, the curtains were drawn too, so I was confused. You couldn't see anything on the outside. Listen, he whispered to me. There was a slow but soft methodical knocking on the windows. It was soft enough to not wake up the whole house, but loud enough for us to hear. Callum's window was directly above the front door, and below the window was a porch with a roof-like shelter. His mum had put a strong trellis for a creeper plant to grow on each side. The trellis was strong enough to support the weight of a fully grown man, if he were to climb it. Callum wanted to call the police, but I said no. I was getting foolish now. I thought I could deal with this. I stood up and walked over to the window. I went to one side and peeked around the blind. I could see the creepy cigarette guy out there on the roof of the shelter. He looked at me through the gap in the blind and waved that girly wave again. He then plastered a piece of paper through the glass of the window, folded up, and placed it under a stone on the outside windowsill. He put a finger across his neck like a knife cutting someone's throat, climbed back down from the shelter, and I pulled up the blinds and watched him walk away up the street into the darkness of the early morning. Once he was gone, I opened the window and grabbed the piece of paper. I unfolded it, and there was a message scrawled in terrible handwriting which read, Watch your backs, you little craps. I know where you live. I showed the note to Callum. He begged me to tell his mum and call the police, and I told him we needed to relax and think about how to proceed very carefully. Could be a mistake, I told him. He may have mistaken us for someone else, who didn't pay him or something like that. Really? Somehow I highly doubt it. Who would mistake us for the Cray twins, Callum said. Honestly, he did have a sassy side that would come out in intense situations. We folded up the letter and hid it under the black rug Callum had on the floor. I went to the bathroom to wash my hands, and then came back to bed. We slept through until 10am, and decided not to tell anyone. We wanted to see if the guy would show up again, and we agreed that if he didn't, then we'd have nothing to say. We never saw him again. We asked Jake, the pot dealer, who his friend in the baseball cap and tracksuit was, and Jake said he didn't know anyone dressed like that, or anyone from Liverpool. After that, we said nothing more to no one. Callum and I stayed together for another year and a half before we decided to mutually end things. We both had met other people we liked. I have now married the girl I dated after me and Callum split, and we have a child together, and I'm working as an English teacher at high school level. Callum went on to date another guy for three years. As far as I know, he has now settled down with a woman he met while backpacking around Spain. I'll always remember what happened that night. I haven't thought about it consciously for years, except for yesterday, as I was standing at the gates of high school, the one I teach at. Me, along with three other staff members, have to supervise the kids as they leave school to get onto school buses and into their parents' cars, etc. As I stood at the gates doing this, I saw a man in a dark full-body tracksuit wearing a baseball cap smoking a cigarette, and the memory of the whole night came flooding back in detail. I wrote it down to share this experience with others anonymously. Keep your eyes peeled, folks, because anyone can be dangerous. Cigarette smoking man, let's never meet again. I was walking along the sidewalk one day and a guy with a windowless van pulls up beside me and said he could give me a bottle of water if I got into his van, as this was summer and a rather hot day. I declined and continued walking, and the guy started shouting and screaming and beating his steering wheel, yelling over and over again, It's free! How can you say no to free? I got to where I was going, which was only a few blocks further, and was a gas station, and had a lovely drink there while talking to the cashier, who was a friend, and reported having the exact same situation happen to her. By chance, I was still there, late that evening, when the shift changed and the incoming cashier reported strange windowless vans idling in the back corner of the lot out of the light. Call the police, was what I felt like saying, but as it happened, a rather sizable dude was in the area. He overheard us swapping stories 
and announced he was going to take care of it. I don't know what happened. None of us three ever saw the van again. Or the big guy, for that matter. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 24 year old female and probably couldn't defend myself from a 10 year old. I went to the grocery store to pick up some things the other night. When I got to the register, there was a man helping me bag my groceries while the cashier was checking me out. I was buying some dog treats and he asked me what kind of dog I had. I said, a golden doodle. And he said, Oh my gosh, me too. I didn't really get an off vibe from him. But he would stare and not break eye contact at all. I chalked it up to him missing social cues and trying to be friendly. After I paid, he started pushing the cart for me out the door. This isn't uncommon, as they typically help you take your things to the car. I have social anxiety and feel very awkward and guilty for them having to do that for me. So I always told them that I'm good and thank you. And every other time they've said, Okay, have a good one. When I gave my usual reply to this guy, he said, Nope, I got it. Very bluntly, and stared at me the entire time. I instantly got a bad vibe from him. It was about eight at night, and barely anyone was there. He said, Well, my shift's over, so I'm walking to my car now anyway. Weird, because he didn't clock out, but maybe he had before he did this last checkout. He was very talkative in the store, asking tons of questions about my dog and telling me about his. But when we got outside, he barely said anything. I started asking questions about his dog, because I felt anxious with the silence. But I really regret that. He took it as an interest and immediately said, Well, if you give me your number, you can meet him and just stared yet again. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't give my number to strangers. I don't want to say no because I have a boyfriend because he seemed like he might get angry over that. When we loaded all the groceries in my trunk, I was thinking, thank goodness, I can get out of here now. But no, the cart was between me and him, and he was positioned on the driver's side. So in order to get to my door, I would have to go past him. Well, I got to get home. My dog's waiting for his treats. He just stared. I realized I was gonna have to go past him if I wanted to leave. So I looked around to see if anyone else was in the parking lot in case something more happened. No one. I started to get extremely nervous. He could push the cart into me or just grab me himself. I've had this traumatic experience before. And my problem is that I don't have a fight or flight. I just kind of freeze. Just like that, he starts walking away, pushing the car to where they are returned in the parking lot. I take the chance to get into the car and lock the doors immediately. I wish I left then, but I needed a moment to breathe. And I saw in my side mirror him getting into his car. I quickly put the car in drive and drove out. The exit is a stoplight. And just my luck, it's red. I'm turning left. I see his car right behind mine not 30 seconds later. I panicked. But then I thought, he said he's going home. It's nothing. I only live two minutes from the grocery store. I made the turn, and he was hanging back. I didn't put my blinkers on for the next turn. And he made it too. The next turn was a stoplight, and then the turn for my road. As I get to the light, it's red again. I thought maybe I should drive to a police station just in case. But as soon as that thought came in to my head, the light went green. My boyfriend and I only moved here two months ago. So I didn't think in my head how to get to the station as I'm terrible at using my phone while driving. And I'm not even 30 seconds from the last turn onto our street. Our street is a dead end with only four houses on it. It's very long and we were at the end. No one goes down it unless they live there or are lost. I turn, and he makes the turn. I literally just directed him to my house. Thankfully, I have Bluetooth and called my boyfriend. I said, a guy from the grocery store is following me. Turn on all the lights, open the gates, and let Nike out. Nike is his German shepherd, and he was trained to be a German police dog, 
and then got extra bite training. He could hold someone for up to six hours. So now knowing he was outside, I wasn't nervous. I was nervous that my boyfriend wouldn't have gotten the gate open in time, and I would have to either sit in my car or get out fast and put the code in. As I pulled in, I saw the gate was open and my boyfriend was on the front porch with Nike on a leash and has his firearm in the air. I fly through and down the driveway and this guy follows. Does he not see the firearm and guard dog? Well, he did at that moment because my boyfriend let Nike go and he charges the guy's car. He jumped up at the driver's window, frothing at the mouth, showing all his teeth and the hair on the back standing up. He looked terrifying even to me, and he was protecting me. I gave Nike his command to come back, hoping this guy got the hint that if he guts out of the car, he's going to perish. And hint he got. He reversed the car so damn fast out the driveway, he nearly hit the gate. I collapsed on the front porch and hugged my boyfriend. Nike got steak for dinner, and I reported the man at the grocery store because I remembered his name on his name tag purposefully. They later contacted me that he had been served his termination papers. This happened a few months ago. I was at my friend Will's birthday party. We met at a nice big park and spent the evening swimming and making mojitos. I spent most of the evening talking to a mutual acquaintance of Will and me, Oliver. Early on, we noticed that me and Oliver lived in the same part of town and decided we'd go home together later, since it was quite a long way. I'm a small female, so the prospect of not having to ride the subway alone in the middle of the night was calming to say the least. As the evening progressed, Oliver became more and more flirty with me. I brushed it off and didn't engage on that since I have a boyfriend and Oliver knew that. Eventually, the party started breaking up, and I was still chatting with Oliver as the other party guests were packing up their stuff. That's when I felt his hand on my butt. I told him calmly to stop touching me, and he obliged. As I tried to explain to him that touching me was not okay, he suddenly became aggressive, called me desperate, amongst other things. At first, I got him to calm down and even apologize to him. And then Will approached us and told us his phone was missing. I left Oliver behind to look for it with another party guest, Tony. We separated from the group to search another corner of the park when Oliver appeared behind us and began screaming. He started to push Tony as he accused us of betraying Will and leaving Will behind and that we stole his phone. He turned to me, insulting me in the worst way while only inches from my face. Tony managed to get him away from me and he eventually ran off. I broke down crying since I fully expected him to hit me. Tony managed to get me to calm down and we rejoined the group. When we did, we found Oliver with them, cursing and running berserk. Will's girlfriend, Rachel, was crying, and as I pulled her away, she told me that Oliver struck her in the face. While Oliver ran through the park screaming and swearing at us, we gathered the group and left. As we did, Will, completely drunk at this point, insisting on returning to the park to find his phone. So he, Tony and me, went back in and used Rachel's phone to try and track his. I knew it was idiotic and dangerous, but Will wouldn't listen and I didn't want to leave my friend alone. I always carry a small blade in my backpack, and this was the first time I took it out with me. I'd never been so scared. We followed Rachel's phone as it led us to the bench, and who did we find? Oliver, slumped over the bench asleep. After checking if he was okay, Will reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Oliver had it the whole time, and had accused us of stealing it and scared us to death when he was the thief. After waking him up and telling him to go home, we left. I ended up crashing at Will's place. I have no idea what went into him that night. 
Everything points to a bad trip. But to my knowledge, there were no other drugs other than alcohol involved. I'm so nervous to see Oliver since we live in the same neighborhood. But I'd rather not meet him again.